Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Gyan Prakash, who is writing a book on emergency. He's written a number of popular books earlier, trying to get into this issue of history as a narrative, which is a little more interesting than what historians normally do. Gyan, good to have you with us. Thank you. Let's, for the time being, step away from the emergency on which there has been a lot of discussions, and we'll wait for your book to come out. But there has been talk about, shall we say, the rise of new kind of politics. Trump being one, Modi, Erdogan in Turkey, and Duterte in Philippines being some of the right. some of those who are being talked about. A kind of, shall we say, populism combined with a very sharp right wing divisive. Uh, mm -hmm. politics. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that seems to be the hallmark of yeah. this kind of uh, figures. Mm -hmm. How do you see this, particularly since you are close to Trump and you've also been close to Shalu the Indian Sinatra? Yeah, well, it, I'm a historian. So, I mean, usually as a historian, I dig. And um, a lot of explanations for, you know, Trump, Modi, Erdogan, uh, Oban, you know, all of those people, uh, has been personality driven. I'm not discounting the role of personality, but I think in the kind of long term. So how is it that at present we have across the world the rise of this kind of uh, right-wing populism? Uh, it's not a coincidence and it cannot be a coincidence that suddenly you have these kinds of populist figures emerge in all these different countries at the same time. So there has to be some deeper reason. In short, I think that you know, what we are uh, witnessing today is a crisis of democracy. Now that can be a cliched sort of term, but if we kind of step back and see, I think it's been in the making at least since the late 70s or early 80s, that was one moment where you could say that there was a kind of a global crisis of uh, ruling regimes. You have cultural revolution in China, you have the Prague Spring, you have emergency in India, you have anti-war uh, movement, you have counterculture across the world. There was some yearning from below uh, which said, that democracy hadn't delivered or various kinds of regimes hadn't delivered. One kind of a solution was imposed through the 60s and 70s, out of which, broadly speaking, we can say we had a neoliberalization of the world. And by neoliberalization, I do not mean just economy, because you can say, well, Adam Smith was about trade and production, whereas neoliberalization means neoliberalization of everything economization of everything, that our society or democracy is not based on the idea of common good, but is based on the winner takes it all. On the basis what of is called the economy is the basic, the core issue is the economy. Yeah. And uh, free trade mm -hmm. is what is going to drive the economy. Yeah. So that, that seems to have been the, shall we say, the pushback mm -hmm. of the crisis of uh, the nation states, which emerged in the period that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of it for the at least the developing countries was really the pushback against the states which had arisen mm -hmm. as a part of the decolonization right. process. Mm -hmm. And as you said, the decolonization process, at least for a lot of the developing countries, had not delivered, yeah. at least for the people. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the pushback in different forms was coming. Yeah. So you are saying that the weakening of the nation state was one of the ways of, the, shall we say, the capitalist forces trying to address the yeah. issue. And actually marshalling the power of the state in favor of a neoliberal economy, where it's not only that the economy should be capitalist, but our universities should be also run on corporate principles, our newspapers should also run on corporate principles, that everything should be economized in that sense. State has failed. The public sector has failed, gov big government has failed, let's mm. hand it over to people who know how to run this, yeah. the quote unquote, the capitalist. Yeah. This, this is the core of the neoliberal the core of the, agenda. Yeah. By, I think, the end of the last century then, uh, this process had, you know, matured. And in India, you could say 1991 and neoliberalization was one moment 
where you can see kind of crystallization of this and then it by UPA2 you see further development of it. And so by the time economic crisis hits, the neoliberalization of the world of course destroys communities. It destroys various kinds of organizations that were in support of people like trade unions and uh, various kinds of cooperative agencies and so on because now it, everything was supposed to be run on market principles. Um, now in the wake of it, uh, after 2007-8 crisis, then what happens is communities around the world now are again saying that democracy hasn't delivered. Uh, now they don't say specifically neoliberalism hasn't de delivered, but what neoliberalism did is that the opposition against the ruling regimes uh, disconnected the, let's say, discontent against ruling regime from any kind of a social and economic analysis. And that's how you get an identity politics, whether it's race or religion, which is completely disconnected with what social and economic policies have done to these societies. So you can now say, Garf se kaho main Hindu uh, or the older whites in America can say make America great again. Uh, founding fathers were white. Right. Of course forget about who were there before the exactly. founding fathers. Yeah. But the whole thing is to turn it against minorities mm -hmm. rather than turn it against the ones who have led these countries mm -hmm. and global capital. Yeah. That's the that's yeah. a, that's really the crux of yeah. it. Isn't so it? I think there, you know, neoliberalism has played a crucial ideological role, which is to, in a way, defang the opposition and direct it in favor of, you know, opposition against minorities and, you know, scapegoat minorities for their problems to say, well, you know, the reason why you are in this condition is because there's appeasement here in India or it's because of affirmative action. These, you know, African Americans are being given positions that they don't deserve. Welfare queens riding Cadillacs. Exactly. The Ronald Reagan yeah. times. Yeah. So, so now we are in a position then, where some demagogue can appear and mobilize these sentiments and say, it's not about the corruption that is inherent in all these kind of a giant, you know giveaways to big corporations, uh, it's because the minorities are being appeased or you know there's corruption in uh, government and so on or whatever. And so if we run the government on the kind of corporate model, all problems will be solved and America will be great again, India will be great again and so on. So withdraw the state further from its redistributive role mm -hmm. which is what at the core yeah. was the reason for government, yeah. that it has a redistributive role, it has a welfare role, mm -hmm. it has some public responsibilities, and this is all a part of democracy. Yeah. Really delink all of it yeah. and say, actually corporations know best, all this affirmative action, appeasement of minorities, etc. should be withdrawn. Dalits, for instance, anti-reservation in India, as you know, yeah. is the other other right. hidden plank of the right here. Yeah. So all of this is essentially to delegitimize the state further, yeah. which is what happened in the 80s, as you talked about. There's a delegitimization of the state and big government, mm -hmm. and now this is to move even further to the right. This is what you are yeah. identifying as a key issue. And, and the state then becomes primarily a, uh, a coercive instrument. So if there are movements, uh, you can call them anti-national and crush them, like JNU or any uh, you know farmers agitation or Dalit agitation or Kashmir. It's all anti-national. Uh, the same thing is happening in the United States. You wield the state and make the state largely a kind of an authoritarian power. So you have this combination of populism and authoritarianism happening at the same time, where the authoritarian leader now claims to be the representative of the people the will of the people, yeah. and that's a familiar slogan. Yeah. Now, coming back to the fundamental issue, how do you fight this? And I'm not talking about only India or only United yeah. States. What is the way forward? Do you see that we need also to talk about how the state should be accountable to the people, yeah. how the 
public sector, which in some sense did get alienated from the people because it appeared to be too big. Mm -hmm. So how to make this accountable is also an element, for instance, the resistance today to these policies well, have to think it's about. It's a crucial question. In fact, 2017, I mean, you remember there was this uh, movement of not in my name uh, against lynching and so on. And I happened to be in Mumbai at that time and there were you know, gatherings of protest. And there were about like 500 people who gathered in Bandra on, uh, on Carter Road. Now, 500 people is nothing in India. It's absolutely nothing. Uh, and so I began to think, uh, yes, there are people who are opposed to, let's say, policies of intolerance from a kind of a liberal point of view. And I applaud that. I mean, it's fine. Uh, but that cannot be the basis for uh, a ground level resistance. There's certainly a resistance that will be effective. And then I began to think of what's happening at the same time in the United States. And I must say, uh, the contrast over there was striking, that the resistance in the US has come largely from women at the ground level. They have broken from the Democratic Party uh, so they're not under any kind of party mobilization. So in one sense, you can say it's also a sign of times that the normal gatekeepers of democracy, the political parties, have lost their appeal. And, yes. and so you have grassroots mobilization. So you have women and you have African Americans, the <coughs> Black Lives Matter movement. Okay? And I was wondering why is it that that's not the case in India? And I think the explanation is that in India, the minorities got equal rights because of nationalism, because of anti-British struggle. There wasn't, I mean, I'm not saying that there was nothing, but there was no comparable, let's say, civil rights movement um, that you could summon and enlist in drawing a kind of a ground level resistance against what's going on in India. Whereas in the US, they can draw on very strong tradition of black civil rights movement uh, and women's movement, which have now come together in resistance against uh, Trump. The tricky part, of course, is that some of it is also being done in identity politics terms, which could be a problem. Mm -hmm. But looking at India, we have also a much bigger history of peasant movement, mm -hmm. farmers movements, working class movement. At the same time, we have the uh, not in my name. And mm -hmm. of course, all of us are also participants in that. Mm -hmm. We also have the working class movement and the peasant movement, particularly the farmers movements, which have taken place in the last three years. Mm -hmm. So it is how to bring these two different strands together. Mm -hmm. The, shall we say, the relatively uh, middle class liberal expressions, mm -hmm. which are important, but nevertheless limited, mm -hmm. and the kind of groundswell of movement which is taking place everywhere, where class and identities have to come together yeah. if we want to de defeat this. And yeah. I think the weakness of the United States is while they have the civil liberties movement to draw upon, the working class movement, the what Martin Luther King started as the basically the poor people's campaign, mm. that has really not taken off. And it's only now you see the poor people's campaign also now developing again. Mm. So I think these are the different strands which need to come together, not only here, but in different countries yeah. for this to change. I mean, in a, in a way, that was the challenge for Bernie Sanders, that Bernie Sanders was able to appeal largely to the young people and frankly saying that you know, I'm a democratic socialist and so on. Now, but somehow he wasn't able to connect with the black civil rights movement, you know. But after the election, things are changing. Um, and you can see that uh, there was like a recent poll in the United States where they said, well, you know, socialism is not a bad word among the young people. And they are proudly... More than 50 percent are willing to say they're Exactly. Socialists. And with the new election in the New York, you know, this 28-year-old, you know, she defeated, you know, a a democratic poll, you know, openly saying she's a democratic socialist. So things are changing where, you know, new kinds of connections are being made. Um, 
here in india i mean i, I say you know dalit movement also has that kind of potential because dalit movement has always been uh, as much about kind of social justice as just about you know dignity uh, so that may be one area uh, if somehow we can bring together you all know the farmers movement strands. dalit movement and all, uh, this, all this together, together. Uh, you could get something which is sort of caste and class together you know do you have, do you see the for instance uh, reverend barbers black I mean the reverend barbers poor people's campaign mm -hmm. do you see that also as an element that can change the scenario in the us it is i think i mean i'm actually quite positive about this and just some the other day someone was saying you know you think trump will win i said we well, you know i didn't think that he would win the last time and i was proven wrong uh, but this time i'm more hopeful because i do see at the kind of a ground level uh, I'm not talking about just university educated people and so on. I mean, I'm really thinking at the ground level, there's a certain kind of a uh, revulsion, not just against him, which is there, of course, uh, but also at they seeing that many things that they took for granted, various kinds of social programs, are being systematically dismantled, and that has real consequences for them. Yeah. Uh, so, like healthcare. For example, uh, it's uh, ironic that you know Obama himself never actually campaigned for healthcare, thinking, well, you know, people will uh, reap benefits and you know it will win popularity. I mean, things don't happen that way, and so I, I don't know. I mean, he was a great election campaigner, but he was a very poor, you know, political judge, you know, of how people actually believe. Uh, so. But then, when people were actually threatened, and in spite of the fact that the Republican Party had all branches of the government under them, they couldn't really repeal the repeal what yeah. they call the Obamacare. Yeah. So it's a it's a it's a state of flux, and we'll have to see how the, all of this is going to develop. Mm. We are li living, as the Chinese say, in interesting times. Yeah, <laughs> we are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gyan, for being with us. Uh -huh. Thank you for watching News Click and be with us on future programs.